And this brings us to the third set of definitions, which are the electrical definitions. The first concept is what we call insulation coordination. What does that mean? When you build a line, at some place you have generation, so you have a dam, you have a nuclear power plant, whatever, and then you have the line and you have substations with transformers, circuit breakers, big equipment. And you, you look at my little sketch here on this slide, uh, you see that you have a substation and on each side you have a power line. If you look at how much money is involved in a transmission power line, very clearly, the biggest money is in the substation. You have expensive transformers. You have a lot of equipment that costs a lot of money and needs to be protected. So when you design a line, and when you try to design the insulation along the line, you define a weak link if you have an electrical event like, for example, lightning. You never want to have an arc inside a substation. So by definition, the insulation coordination is a set of calculation which is made by the designer of the line, by which he's going to put the weak link on the transmission line and not in the substation. So that the insulation on the transmission line is lower than the insulation in the substation. Now, of course, in a substation, you also have other protections. You have surge arresters, you have circuit breakers, you have all kinds of equipment in the substation to protect it. But the basic first fundamental rule in insulation coordination is that by definition, you design your overhead line as the weak link. So if any arcing activity occurs, it happens on the line and not in the substation. Then you have to determine what we call a clearance. The clearance is the distance between the conductors and the tower. So this is a small video which was made in our laboratory in Bazette. You will see that in this test, we try to determine where the arc is going to take place. Is it going to be vertical between the two legs of the V-string or on the side to uh, the side of the window that simulates this, um, uh, this tower. Designers are going to try to choose where the arc should take place first. And you need to have a certain distance which will actually determine what is the voltage at which the arc will take place. You will define this distance for a number of reasons, uh, insulation under different conditions, which we'll see in a minute, the possibility for maintenance to climb the tower, go around the conductors without being in danger. This is what we call lifeline work. And for that, you have minimum approach distance rules, which exist for each type of line. But overall, this all contributes to the definition of a distance, which is the distance between the conductors and anything that is grounded. And typically, the tower is grounded. This clearance is determined by several different uh, physical properties, which we will see in a minute. Definitions. I mentioned clearance. Clearance is, as I said, the distance between the conductor and the tower, which means you expect, if there is an arc, you expect this arc to go from the conductor to the tower, going through air. On an insulator string, you have one parameter, which is called arcing distance. This is the shortest distance an arc will follow going from the energized side to the ground side without looking at the shape of the insulator. It is the shortest distance. As you can see as a picture, especially the one in the middle, you see the arc is actually going from one side to the other of the insulator without following the profile. This is what we call the arcing distance. And several 
electrical characteristics of an insulator string and an unit, an insulator itself, are defined by the arcing distance. It is the shortest air gap the arc can take. When you have an arc, it is what we call a flashover. The flashover is when the air is not anymore capable to insulate the voltage that is applied on a line, and the breakdown of air, which is disruptive, will generate what we call a flashover. If you have a voltage applied on an insulator string and nothing happens, it is what we call a Whiston. And you will see that on drawings of insulators, you have Whiston values and you have flashover values. Now, the slide you see here is a satellite digital representation of the world flash density, which is the density of lightning across the globe. Uh, and you see, for example, that the biggest concentration of lightning is in Central Africa. Now, lightning occur around the globe every day, every second, there is a lightning somewhere. Uh, the question is, when you have to build the power line, lightning can be disruptive. So we need to manage lightning on a power line. Now, when you look at the drawing of insulators, and I just took this one, which is actually a typical drawing for the Canadian market, you see that there are several definitions. If you look at electrical performance characteristics, you have first low frequency. Low frequency is a 50 hertz or 60 hertz voltage applied on the insulator. And the value we guarantee is either a flashover value, meaning that, for example, if I say my insulator is capable uh, to have a flashover of 100 kilovolt, if I do my test at 50 hertz or 60 hertz, you're going to see that 100 kilovolt, at least, it can be higher, but there will be an arc. But you will not have a flashover below that value. If I say I have a 100 kilovolt Western value, it means that if I apply 100 kilovolt at 50 hertz, nothing is going to happen. The flashover value or the Western value in power frequency can be tested in dry conditions or under rain. So we have two ratings, as you can see, dry flashover voltage, wet flashover voltage. So now we are saying it's raining. All right. On top of it, you have a thunderstorm now. So you have lightning. The second definition you see here is critical impulse flashover voltage. This is a uh, voltage that is applied on a very short term basis, simulating the lightning. And we give values in our catalogs, which are impulse flashover or Western values, both exist. We give impulse values, which simulate what can happen with the lightning. And of course, a lightning can have two polarities. Either you have a lightning that is positive or negative. So on our drawing, you see that we give a critical impulse flashover value in both polarities, positive or negative. So these are the most important values which we are dealing with in terms of electrical behavior in service. Then you see here on this drawing, you have another definition, which is low frequency puncture voltage. So this is a test which is performed on an insulator in oil. Why oil? Because oil has a higher insulation characteristic than air. So you are increasing the voltage at 50 hertz on an insulator that is in oil, and you check if it breaks or not. That's a characteristic of the quality of your dielectric. You have another definition which we will comment a little bit later, which is called radio interference test voltage. This is a value which we guarantee uh, in terms of uh, influence or uh, disorder that a power line brings into the radio frequency, uh, frequency band. So when you listen to a radio, if you have a radio, 
near a power line, you can hear some crazy noise in your radio. This is a result of radio interference. So we give a guarantee of a maximum noise in the radio frequency band of our insulators at a certain voltage. So these are the electrical definitions we give on all our drawings. And now if we look at uh, what those really are, if we start with lightning, again, you don't control a thunderstorm. Lightning will come in and touch a line in very strange ways. Uh, you see here on the picture, there is a lightning that is actually touching the famous shield wire I described at the beginning of my presentation. It is in direct contact with the ground value of the tower itself. And you see, it's, it's very interesting to see that all three insulator strings have a flashover. So this is because when the lightning hits the tower on a very short term basis, the voltage of the, the entire tower goes at very high values, and these values being higher than the voltage of the line, you have actually a flashover going from the tower to the conductor, and not from the conductor to the tower, like we would normally uh, believe things would happen. It is what you call a back flashover. Now, when you have an impulse, and you have to simulate the impulse in the laboratory, you're going to increase the voltage quickly to a certain value, and then it will come down a, a little bit in a slower pace, but still fast. If you look at the graph on this slide, you see that the voltage will increase quickly between 0 0.1 and 20 microseconds. When we do the lightning test in our laboratories, typically we would have what we call a crest time, which goes up at 1.2 uh, microseconds. The tail, which is when the voltage is decreasing, would typically take 50 microseconds. So we are in the microsecond uh, world. This is a test which is done on positive and negative polarity. Lightning is a phenomenon that is relatively quick, and it is described by a word which is BIL. It's an acronym for Basic Insulation Level. The basic insulation level is the impulse withstand voltage, the, the lightning impulse withstand value that an insulator or an insulator string can take. And again, we guarantee these values in our catalogs. And when you have a string designed by an engineering uh, company that is designing a line, they're typically going to ask that the insulators multiplied by 20, 25 times making up a string is capable to withstand a certain value or have a flashover value that is defined by the manufacturer. You have a second uh, impulse value that is commonly used for insulator strings. It is what we call the BSL, basic switching level. Now we are no longer talking about lightning. What we are talking about here is an event which is the result of people who are managing the power line. For example, you have a power line that is not energized and you're going to energize this power line. When you bring the power on the line, you have what we call a switching surge. Instantaneously, the voltage is higher than the nominal voltage of the line. So this surge is what we call a switching surge, and we give uh, values of switching impulse when we look at an entire string of insulators, uh, because this is something that you need to take into consideration when you design a line. The switching is, however, a parameter that is not of any importance at low voltage lines. For example, if you have a distribution line, 24 kV, uh, you don't care about switching. If you have a line that is 110 kV, you don't care about switching because the dominant parameter is going to be your lightning. 
above 345 kV, lines are designed with switching impulse more than lightning impulse because switching will take place at a lower value than the lightning impulse for a string that is relatively long, typically 345 kV and above. Why is the switching more critical? It's because it's a phenomenon that is not as fast as a lightning impulse. As you can see on the graph here, uh, the raising time for the voltage is much longer. If you remember earlier, we, we were talking about 1.2 microsecond. Here, we are talking about something between 20 and 5,000 microseconds. It's a much softer impulse than a lightning impulse. Now, the law of physics says that the slower you go on to increase the voltage, the more you're going to have a flashover value at a low value. If you bring a stress very quickly on a string of insulators, air will have no time to be disrupted, which means that it will disrupt later on compared to the same voltage which you would apply very slowly. Because when you increase the voltage slowly, the ionization of the air around your insulator will take place quickly so that at some point in time you have a flashover. If you bring this voltage very quickly, air is not going to have the time to be ionized as quickly and you will have a flashover at a higher value because the air will resist longer. So switching is a test condition which will uh, be used to determine the, the electric strength of a string of insulators when you have a very high voltage line, 345 kV, 500 kV lines. And when you look at the standards, you find here uh, a table which is a classical table used worldwide which gives you lightning impulse and switching impulse requirements for a given voltage. So if you take a 500 kV line, by the standard rules, a 500 kV line is considered to be a maximum voltage of 550. For a 500 kV line, meaning 550 maximum voltage, you see that you have different options of basic lightning impulse and basic switching impulse. And you choose a value which fits your insulation coordination, as I explained earlier, between your line and your substation. So you can have, for example, a 550 kV line, which will have an impulse withstand of 1525 kV and a switching of 1405. Uh, uh, so, so you see the switching is always lower than the impulse, the lightning impulse. And when we, when we are talking about a 500 kV line, which by definition is in fact a 550 kV line, we are talking about a voltage, which is what we call phase to phase. Between two conductors, you have three conductors on an AC line. Between two conductors, you're going to have 550 kilovolt. But if you divide this 550 kilovolt by root square of three, you end up with a value which is 318 kilovolt. This is what we call the phase to ground value. So between phases, you're going to have 500 kV, but you're going to have 300 kV between the conductors and the ground side of a string of insulators. Because the string of insulators obviously is insulating a phase to ground and not a phase to phase value. Power arc. You might have heard this word. All the electric tests which we do in our laboratories are electrical tests where you have a high voltage but a very low current. This is what we call dielectric testing. In the real world, power lines have also a high current. So if you have a flashover in a real line, you're going to have simultaneously a high voltage and a high power, a high current, which contributes to a high power. When you do a power arc test, you need to apply a very high level of energy 
which is something we do not do in our laboratories. It is something you do only in very special places where you can bring simultaneously high voltage, high current. The video I'm going to show you here is a power arc test. The customer had a requirement that the line and the insulators should not be destroyed if you apply 63 kilo amps, meaning 63,000 amp, for one second. Now, if you make the calculation, during this test, on an instantaneous value, we have consumed the equivalence of one nuclear reactor for a fraction of a second. So I show you this test. It's a much more brutal test than what we do in our labs. All right, there we go. So a power arc test is designed to verify that you do not destroy the insulator string. Hardware will survive. And after that, of course, there are several tests to validate that the insulators are OK. So you see, there is a difference between most tests which we do in our labs, which are dielectric tests, high voltage, low current, and power arc tests, where you do simultaneously high voltage, high current. It's a validation of the resiliency of your insulator string to uh, extreme events. Then there is another test, another electric test, which is something you probably have heard Sandiver talking about over and over and over. It's what we call a steep front wave test. You remember my story about the lightning, which comes in with a speed around 1.2 microsecond, the switching, which is around 250 microsecond. Well, steep front test is completely different. Deep front test, we are not testing an insulator to see at what value it will flash over. We are testing in steep front test the insulator to see if the dielectric material is of good quality. If we don't have defects or flaws, which can be a problem for the electrical performance of an insulator if you have such an event like a lightning. So in a steep front wave, the voltage is actually applied very quickly, typically 10 times faster than a lightning impulse. Again, lightning impulse around 1.2 microsecond for steep front is around 0 0.1 microsecond. So it's a much more brutal event, which will challenge the dielectric material. We don't care about the voltage at which the, the arc will take place. A steep front wave test is a test which is intended to check the quality of the dielectric. For Sediver, this is an extremely important test because it is clear and well understood in the marketplace that lousy quality will fail this test and that very good quality will pass this test. Again, you see here, uh, a small uh, sketch showing you the difference between a lightning and a steep front wave. You see the steep front wave, which is actually that huge bump, quick bump uh, on the timeline. And you see a much slower uh, voltage increase, which is a lightning impulse. So we really go much faster than in a lightning impulse. Electric field. You probably have heard that Sediver makes electric field calculations. Why? Because we have customers, when they design a line, when they design a string of insulators, obviously they're going to choose hardware, different components to connect insulators with the conductors. And you want to be sure that you do not generate radio interference. You remember what I said earlier, radio interference is noise emitted in the radio frequency band, which is not something you want to have. Depending on the shape of the hardware and the quality of the insulator, this RIV level will be more or less high. Likewise, if you have hardware with sharp edges, or you have insulators for which the cement, the quality of the cement around the pin is not totally smooth, if you have some dirt, some cement, drops staying around the pin, 
if your cap is not well connected to the glass shell with a nice and clean uh, rim around the frock, your insulators or your hardware are going to generate what we call corona. Corona is small activity like you see on the, on the picture at the right. You see the white arrow. There is a little purple light on an insulator. This is what we call corona. Corona is uh, the consequence of discharges, low discharge activity through breakdown of air which is a result of a high electric field that is locally present either on the insulator or on some hardware. And if you want to know if your string design is correct, you make what you call an electric field calculation, like you can see in the middle or on the left of this slide. So when we do this type of calculation, we actually create a model on a computer that will duplicate the actual string of insulators with the conductors and the hardware all connected together. And we look what is the density of uh, the electric field along the shape of the insulators. And uh, it's quite interesting when you look at this uh, slide, for example, the, the, middle, the middle slide, you see that you have a concentration of the electric field near the pin of the first insulator of the string. And if you look at the test which was made in our laboratory in Bazet uh, some years ago on such a string, you see we have corona showing up exactly in that location. So it, it, there is a good correlation between electric field and corona testing. So again, definitions. Electric field simulation is a mathematical model you run on your computer to see the electric density around the design of your string. If you have high electric fields in some areas of your insulator string, it will generate either radio interference, which is something you can test for in the lab, or corona, which is disruption of air, air breakdown, electric breakdown of air, very close to those sharp edges or small defects you have on an insulator. 